it's a, a great song to lead into communion, I mean into the sermon and communion. Um, hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Great words, great song. Well, if you're visiting us today, we're going through the Gospel of Mark, and so I invite all of you to take your Bibles again and open up to uh, Mark chapter 14. This chapter is the, uh, the longest one in Mark's Gospel. It's 72 verses long, and we're up to the last section now, verses 66 to 72. Today we're going to see what I've called the illogical denials. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with Peter's denying of Christ. Three times he denied him. And so this is that passage. It's a, somewhat of a, um, an emotional passage. It ends in heartache and tears. And so we're going to look at that this morning. But just before we get into that, just a, a quick reminder of where we're up to. Remember last Sunday we looked at the um, three illegal trials of Jesus. Remember, Jesus has just been arrested. Uh, He had been betrayed by Judas, one of his disciples. He had been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it's now the middle of the night, and he was uh, hurriedly raced off to the high priest's private house, where he was put uh, put on trial in front of the Sanhedrin. It was a bit of a makeshift, a legal trial that took place in the middle of the night, and he was found to be guilty. Guilty of blasphemy was the accusation. And we know as we look at Scripture and understand the Gospels that that court case was a bit of a sham. Jesus wasn't really guilty of any crime whatsoever. He was was an innocent man. And we know that the religious leaders, though, of that day hated Jesus, and they wanted him dead, and so they fabricated this trial and, and a crime and pinned it on Jesus. And that's where we finished up last Sunday morning. Now, if you're reading this gospel story, and, and, and perhaps if this is the very first time you've read it, imagine that, the last thing that you would expect to happen at this point in the story is that one of Jesus' closest friends is about to deny him. He's about to, in many ways, just turn his back on him. We know that Jesus has had a lot of enemies as we've uh, tracked through this gospel for the last three and a half years of his life. And we know that just recently Judas has turned against Jesus, but now Jesus' closest, you could say maybe his closest earthly companion, is about to deny him repeatedly. I'm sure many of us know what it's like to have a close friend turn against us and maybe even say some nasty things behind our backs. Well, Jesus is about to experience that same kind of rejection from the disciple Peter. Well, let's read through the text together. Mark 14, we'll begin reading in verse uh, 66. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time, And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Maybe just a a quick reminder about the author of this gospel. Remember, this is Mark who is writing this gospel. And if you remember that Mark and Peter are very good friends, And it's assumed by most Bible scholars that when Mark wrote this gospel, he was in Rome and sitting right alongside him was Peter. And so Mark would have had firsthand accurate details about what happened on this particular occasion because Peter was right there with him. 
So let's look at these three denials, and, and as we examine the text, I trust that we will be learning some lessons so that we may not fall into the same trap that Peter fell into at this particular time of his life. So we'll look at these denials. The first denial we'll see, Jesus, um, Peter says, I do not know what you mean. You know, this idea of denying Christ or denying God is a serious issue. You know, there are some things in life that you might deny. You might deny the existence of Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy or Martians on Mars. Those are pretty easy things to deny. You might deny evolution or global warming or gender identity, or you could deny the existence of dinosaurs or the rapture of the church or the inerrancy of scripture or whatever. You could deny a, deny a whole lot of things. But it's totally the next level. In fact, it's probably the highest level when you deny God or deny Jesus Christ. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, 32. He said, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. So it's a serious thing to deny Christ. Again, in Acts 3, verse 14, speaking to those who had rejected Christ, it says there, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. And so denying Christ is a dangerous situation. Sounds like they're having fun out the back, right? This is good. I want to go join in. <laughs> well, back here in, in Mark chapter, uh, chapter 14, while Jesus has been falsely accused and mocked at an, at an illegal trial upstairs in the high priest's house, an informal trial of sorts is taking place in the courtyard outside and this time, the informal trial really is between a young girl accusing the disciple, Peter. And maybe just to even set the scene a little bit more for this passage, I just need to go back and remind you of a couple of verses earlier in Mark's gospel in chapter 14. Remember when Jesus was celebrating the Passover feast in the upper room just a few hours earlier than this event um, that's about to take place in, in verses 30 and 31, Jesus said to Peter, remember this, truly I tell you, this very night before the roster, <laughs> roster, rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same, all the disciples said the same. Famous last word, right? Well, verse 66, if you look at the text here, it introduces us to this servant girl. She had the responsibility of working for the high priest. Her job was kind of like a, you could say she was a little bit like a receptionist at the front door who would let the guests come into the private residence of the high priest. She was probably the girl who had originally opened the gate and let in Peter. And remember, Peter showed up at this house with, uh, um, with the other disciple, most likely John, and so this girl would have let them into the private courtyard of Caiaphas. And remember on this particular night, Peter's just hanging around outside. It's a cold night. Remember, it's the middle of the night. It's midnight. It's one o'clock in the morning, maybe, and Peter's out there in the courtyard, and he's warming himself. And upstairs, as I said, Jesus was being subjected to an illegal, unjust trial in front of the Sanhedrin. Now, this servant girl, she had obviously been um, traveling around, walking around Jerusalem the previous few days. She may have been in the crowd when Jesus came um, into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, remember, on that Palm Sunday a few days earlier. Or she may have been at the temple when Jesus was teaching. And if she was at either of those occasions, she probably would have seen the disciples hanging around with Jesus. And so she would have recognized the face of Peter. His face was familiar. And so she says to Peter in these verses, she says, you, kind of, maybe she was talking to Peter, maybe pointing her finger at him and saying, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. Now, I'm guessing that Peter was caught off guard a little bit by that statement by this girl. 
and he didn't really want to be identified, certainly not by this young girl, and so he disagrees with her accusation. It says that he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And when you think about it, this answer that Peter gives is a bit of a, it's a kind of a dumb answer. It was really meant to be a yes, I was, or a no, I wasn't answer. That's what she was looking for. But Peter, maybe because he was shocked by the questions, jumbles his words a little bit here. And he says, I neither know nor understand what you mean. It wasn't really a very good answer. In fact, it was a blatant lie from Peter, a clear and obvious violation of the ninth commandment. And why did he deny Jesus? Why was Peter willing to do this? Well, he was afraid. He was fearing for his life. His life was in danger here. And just remember what Peter had done just a, a few hours earlier with the sword when he cut off that guy's ear. Well, if the, if the soldiers were as quick at swinging their swords as Peter was swinging his sword back in the Garden of Gethsemane, then Peter would be in serious danger here of losing his life, maybe by losing his head. Now, after this uh, first denial, Peter shuffles away into another area of this private residence. This, uh, I remember last time we looked at this was Caiaphas's house. It was the high priest. It was also probably his father-in-law's uh, place. It was probably like a big area, a big mansion kind of area. And so Peter shuffles away from the courtyard to this uh, porch area. And Mark tells us after this first denial that the rooster crows, but at this point it didn't, that didn't register at all in Peter's mind. I remember I said it's the middle of the night or early morning. It, it must have been normal, obviously, for roosters to crow at that hour of the night because the noise of it didn't trigger anything in the mind of Peter, not at this point anyway. And remember, Jesus had said that it was after the rooster crowed twice that he would have denied him three times. And so Peter moves away. He shuffles off to another area of the property, and, and there's, there's probably a number of people outside in this courtyard and in this property. And Peter is obviously trying to go and hide amongst the crowd. He just wants to blend in with the crowd. That's the first denial we see. The second denial we see in verses 69 and 70. Now, this same servant girl is, is obviously walking around outside as, as well. Remember, this is Passover night. This is a big celebration in the, in, in the time of the Jewish people. And so many people were up celebrating the meal and they were celebrating the Passover and it would have been a celebration going into the early hours of the morning. And so this girl's wandering around in the crowd there and she sees Peter's face again and she starts to talk to some of the other people who are in the crowd outside the house here. And maybe she says something like, I'm pretty sure that, the, that this guy was hanging out with Jesus. He looks familiar. He looks very, very familiar. And as she talks to people in the crowd, Peter's overhearing the crowd, and he hears the conversation that she, where she says, this man was one of them. In other words, this man was one of Jesus' close followers. This man was a disciple of Jesus, she claims. And then for a second time in verse 70 there, Peter denies any relationship with Jesus, and he tells another blatant lie to this girl, and even maybe to those who were in the crowd who suspected the same thing. And then we see the third denial in verse 70 and verse 71. That's not the rooster crowing, that's the phone ringing. <laughs> that's all right. The third denial in verse 70 and verse 71. Other gospels tell us that it's about an hour or so after the second denial that the third denial happens. <laughs> That's all right. It's uh, just uh, phone ring. <laughs> Peter here, he's out in the courtyard. He's still lingering in the crowd. He's trying to blend in with the crowd, and he's, he's quietly chatting away, obviously, with the people that are there. Remember, Peter's there because he's waiting to see what's going to happen upstairs with the trial with Jesus. Well, he's there chatting with the people, and the conversation that he's having turns again to Peter's identity and his connection with Christ. And this time, part of the conversation has to do with Peter's accent, the way he talks. 
I mean, obviously, Israel, like in New Zealand and many countries, we have different accents and different dialects depending on whereabouts in the country you live. I mean, if you are in New Zealand and you're a Southlander, you roll your R's, right, and you know where they're from. The bird flew up the Gore River as the nurse was on her way to work. You know that they're from Southland, right, with a tinge of Scottish in there. <coughs> Well, Jews from Galilee in the northern part of Israel spoke with a different accent to those who lived in the southern part of Israel, down where Jerusalem was located. And so Peter's accent was giving him away here. He was a citizen of Galilee, and he sounded like one. And and also, if you were a Galilean, you were considered to be uneducated and a few pegs down the social ladder. And so the people in the crowd could tell that Peter was from northern Israel. And everybody also knew that Jesus was from northern Israel. He was from Galilee. And so Peter's accent suggested that he too came from there and therefore was connected to Jesus Christ. Also at this particular moment, not recorded in Mark's gospel, but there was another person in the crowd who was related to the guy who had his ear cut off. Remember that guy that Peter cut his ear off? And this particular relative looks at Peter and probably says something like, hey, aren't you the guy who was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the guy who chopped my cousin's ear off? You look just like him. You can read about that in John 18. Now imagine being Peter at that moment. I mean, that certainly would have heightened his emotions. He was already feeling threatened and scared and no doubt hearing this man's comments put panic in him. His life is truly in danger here. And so Peter is trying to hide his anxiety and trying to hide his fear, and he puts on somewhat of an astonished face, a bit of an act, and he denies the accusation. He says there in verse 71, I do not know this man of whom you speak. In fact, Peter is so good at lying and denying and deceiving that he literally says this, He says, if I'm lying, let God curse me. If I'm lying, may God bring something horrible into my life. In other words, Peter is saying here, I will make a vow to let God condemn me if I'm found to be guilty of your accusation. I mean, this is really stupidity flowing out of the lips of Peter. I mean, what a foolish thing to say. But it's true, though, isn't it? Any, most liars say silly things to cover up their lies. And his lying really does reveal the extreme danger that he was facing. He would do anything at this moment. Peter would do anything, include deny Jesus Christ, to protect himself from being harmed or perhaps losing his own life. And there's a little touch of irony here when you think about what's going on because upstairs Jesus has been in in this trial and he's been accused of being a blasphemer, but he isn't. And the real blasphemer, maybe the real lawbreaker, the real liar is outside down in the courtyard denying Christ, Peter himself, refusing to identify with the Messiah. I mean, this is quite a shambles, right? When you think about all of this and what's going on, how can the how can the chief of the disciples, how can the spokesman of the disciples, how can the leader of the twelve sink to such a low point in his life to these to commit these three illogical denials? All within a couple of hours. Remember what Peter had said a few hours earlier back in the upper room when he was with Jesus? Lord, I'll never deny you. In fact, I'm willing to die before I ever deny you. The reality is the fear of death fueled his denials. And notice what happens after this third denial here in verse 72. It says, immediately, which is one of Mark's favorite words all the way through the Gospel of Mark, immediately the rooster crowed a second time just as Jesus said it would. A split second After Peter makes this third denial, the rooster crows for a second time. Think about that. What does that tell you and what does that tell us about the prophetic or the predictive power of Jesus Christ? He was absolutely spot on. 
He not only knows every detail, detail about what's going to happen in the future, he knows exactly when it is going to happen. You know, if that rooster had chosen to say good morning to all the other roosters there 30 seconds earlier, Jesus' prediction wouldn't have been accurate. But it was. Immediately, the rooster crowed a second time. And remember, at this time too, Jesus was still being held by the, the soldiers. Um, those, um, these three denials were taking place while Jesus was being questioned upstairs, as I've said, by the Sanhedrin. And the trial for Jesus has now come to an end, and they're about to leave the house. They're about to leave the high priest's residence, and they're about to head off to the third Jewish trial, which we looked at briefly last week, which is found in chapter 15, verse 1 of Mark's gospel. Jesus is obviously under guard. He's leaving Caiaphas' house, and he's on his way to the public council chamber. And listen to what Luke tells us in his account as Jesus leaves that property and walks through the courtyard. Luke says this in Luke 22, 61, he says, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Imagine that. Just impeccable timing again that Jesus was able to look directly at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he, Peter, went out and wept bitterly. Mark says he broke down and wept. This crowing of the rooster the second time brings about remorse and ultimately it brings about repentance. I mean, it's a a fascinating part of the story, really. Mark doesn't record it, as I said. But for a split second, Jesus and Peter lock eyes together in the courtyard. And at that moment, Peter has one of those oh no moments. He's just instantly overwhelmed with guilt and shame and remorse in total contrast to Judas's situation. And Peter here, in a sense, goes into shock at the realization of what he's just done. The shock of it kind of sweeps through his mind and through his body. No doubt Peter's heart is pumping, his head is spinning, his shame is multiplied, and his emotions are just completely overwhelming him. And it says here that he broke down and wept, overcome with emotion. As I said, he was feeling the shame and the guilt and now the remorse for what he's done. I mean, this is Peter. This This is the top disciple in many ways. That hardened fisherman, this is the the leader of the pack, the supposedly robust and confident, strong man. But he's broken. And he breaks down in tears. Why? Because he remembers what Jesus said to him. If you notice what verse 72 says here, the rooster crowing wasn't what brought about Peter's remorse. It was the words of Christ ringing in Peter's ears that brought about his reaction. Peter remembered Jesus saying, you will deny me three times. The rooster obviously played an important part in this story. In fact, it's interesting when you look at scripture and look at some of the the animals and the things that Jesus used and God used to draw people's attention to himself. He once used a donkey, right? He used a A worm was it at the end of Jonah in the Jonah story, but now the Lord is using a rooster to help Peter remember the words that Jesus had said to him. Let me just backtrack a moment here. When when Jesus and Peter were locking eyes together, what do you think was going through the mind of Jesus? What do you think Jesus was thinking as he looked across that courtyard and the crowds of people and he looked directly into Peter's eyes? What was he thinking? How would you answer that question? And be careful how you would answer it. Was Jesus thinking, you foolish disciple, you weak need, clumsy man, what were you thinking? I told you you were going to mess up and deny me. You deserve judgment, you deserve wrath. I hope you're not thinking like that. 
because I don't think Jesus was thinking that at all. It was a, sure, it was a look of disappointment, it was a look of sadness, but I think it was a look of sympathy, it was a, a look of forgiveness. Peter, you've made a big mistake, but I am going to forgive you. And I'm glad that God is like that. And Graham reminded us this morning that uh, you know, God's not a judging God. There is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. God is a forgiving God, and that's how he was going to treat Peter, and that's how he treats us. He's a God of mercy and a God of grace. And we can't really finish this passage without jumping ahead just quickly to have a look at John 21. I'm sure you'll be familiar with that passage. You can turn over there and have a look at it because what, we ask the question, well, what happens next? What happens as they leave that high priest's residence? Well, we don't really know where Peter goes. We have no idea. We don't know if he repented straight away. Maybe he did. But we do know that after the crucifixion and then after the resurrection of Christ, Jesus and the disciples gathered together again just in a few days' time up in Galilee. And there was this meaningful reunion with Jesus and his disciples, and especially for Peter. There was this little event that took place in John 21 verses 15 to 19 it says this when they had finished breakfast Jesus said to Simon Peter Simon son of John do you love me more than these and he said to him yes Lord you know that I love you and Jesus said to him feed my lambs he said to him a second time Simon son of John this is Peter do you love me And Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. And Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, Peter, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to Jesus, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Peter Do you love me? How many times did Jesus ask Peter this question? Three times. Why three times? Mark 14. Also, remember back in the Garden of Gethsemane. How many times did Peter fall asleep when he was supposed to be watching and praying? Three times. You know, Jesus had a heart of forgiveness for Peter. Back in the courtyard of Caiaphas's house he didn't look at him with judgment and condemnation in his eyes he looked at him with love and grace and forgiveness let me ask you parents how do you look at your kids when they disobey you what's your first reaction what's your default response is it judgment and discipline Or is it love and grace and forgiveness? How do you respond when somebody offends you, whatever it might be? Do you want to retaliate and do you want to fight? Or do you respond with love and grace and a willingness to forgive? How would you respond? I want us to just think a little bit more about what this means to deny Christ. I mean, we all have momentary lapses in our life. None of us are immune to to this kind of thing. And in case you think that Peter has lost the plot and is far worse than any of us, we really need to think about that again. Are we seriously any different than Peter? We're probably more like Peter than we're really willing to admit. You know, Peter had his weaknesses, he had his issues, we've seen his weaknesses come out of the Gospels, he was overconfident when he said, I will not deny you, I will not fall away. He often lacked spiritual fervor and energy because he was sleeping instead of praying. He was impulsive at times, we know that, he was far too quick to speak a number of times and he was obviously too quick to pull out his sword in the Garden of Gethsemane, he didn't show any patience there. And so Peter's denials are really just a result of his little failures all the way along his life's journey, but they led him to be dishonest, disloyal, and disobedient. But you know, like Peter, we have 
similar daily experiences of denying Christ. We might not say to another person, I do not know Jesus or I never knew him. It might be a little bit more subtle than that. When you're at work or when you're at school or wherever you might be and somebody comes up to you and says, aren't you a Christian? And you're like, "Uh, um, uh," and you don't really answer it very well and you change the subject. That's kind of like a little denial. Even when we try to fix our own spiritual problems and our own strength, are we not denying Christ in the sense that we're denying his power? We try to look godly sometimes, but we deny the power of God to be able to help us to be godly. You know, we can, in a sense, deny Christ when we fail to pray because we think that we've got the spiritual resources and the spiritual power to take care of all our own problems. A prayerless Christian is denying the power of God and relying instead on the power of man. That's a form of denial of what Christ is and what he can do for us. You know, the Bible says it's not by human might, it's not by human power that we're supposed to live, but we're to live by the Spirit, according to Zechariah. When we don't put on the spiritual armor and fight the battles like God wants us to to do, then in a sense we're denying to do what Christ wants us to do. When we leave our Bible on the shelf or in the back seat of the car during the week and it collects dust, that's, a, that's a, in a sense a denial of Christ because we're denying the power that's in it that he wants us to utilize. The Bible is our necessary spiritual food. We need to feast on it. We deny Christ really when we give in to any temptation in life. Because we're not trusting in divine resources, we're trusting in human resources. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. God is faithful. When you are tempted, he will provide a way of escape. So when we choose, sorry, when we sin, we are choosing to take our own pathway. And so we deny what Christ has provided for us. So whenever we sin, we're in one sense denying Christ. We're living like he doesn't exists. It's kind of like what we call sometimes practical atheism. That means that we live as if God doesn't exist. That's what all of us do. Whenever you sin, you're living like a practical atheist, pretending that God doesn't exist. But you know, there are times when we, like Peter, want to try and blend into the crowd. Maybe we're a little bit afraid to stand up for what we believe, stand up for Christ, to uphold the truth, to shine the light. We, we get scared and afraid just like what Peter did. How about this practical application from 1 Timothy 5 verse 8? If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I mean, as, a, as a followers of Christ, we have responsibility, practical responsibilities to look after our own family. If we don't look after our own families, we're in a sense denying the truth. We're denying the faith, it says. In a sense, we're denying Christ and what he wants us to do. We definitely need, need to heed the warning of 2 Timothy 2.12. If we deny him, he also will deny us. There's another warning in 1 John 2, 23. It says this. This is a a stronger warning. It says, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. What does that mean? Well, the context here is this. If you continually reject Christ, if you continually, as a pattern of your life, deny Jesus Christ, you don't have the Father. You don't have a relationship with God. You're not a believer. Yes, we have momentary lapses like Peter did. But if you're a true believer, you will not have continual, blatant denying of Christ in all its fullness. First John tells us if we continually live like that and don't repent, then we aren't believers. You know, Peter thought that he would die for Jesus, but the reality is Peter needed Jesus to die for him. And to be honest, we needed the same thing, don't we? The death of Christ is so crucial because his death is what gives us life. It's his death that gives us eternal life. His death makes it possible for us to live as faithful, obedient obedient children. And so we desperately needed the death of Christ. And we're going to be looking at 
what that looks like in the next uh, chapter or so in Mark's gospel. We desperately need Christ. We definitely need, desperately need his death, burial, and resurrection. And we desperately need to follow him and ask him to forgive us of our sins. Peter made some horrendous mistakes. But let me say this. Peter followed up his horrendous mistakes with some great choices and some great decisions. He went on and he repented of his denial. He turned from his wicked actions. His pride, his arrogance was replaced with humility. His strong fear of death was replaced with a strong faith in God. And God extended his forgiveness to Peter and his mercy and his grace. And Peter changed. We, we see that as we read through the gospel, I mean, through the, the book of Acts. He changed to become a, a, a powerful preacher and thousands of people got saved. And he wasn't perfect, but his life was dramatically changed because he repented of his sin and God forgave him of his sin. Well, Peter's story, I, I trust, is a, a great reminder to all of us that God is a gracious God, that he's a forgiving God, that we do mess up. We make mistakes, we say things we shouldn't say, we do things we shouldn't do, we think things that we shouldn't think, but God is a gracious God, a forgiving God, a loving God, and he will, he will accept our repentance and will restore us as he did with Peter. I trust that these will be words of encouragement to you as we face the battles and the challenges of life, that we too can be a bit like Peter, not that we deny Christ, but that if we do things wrong, that we will repent and we know that God will restore us. Well, let's bow our heads in prayer and I think the team are going to come up and lead us in one final song. <coughs> Father, just want to reiterate our gratefulness for who you are, that you are a loving, gracious, forgiving God, and that, Lord, whenever we slip up, whenever we sin, whenever we do what we ought not to do, you're there willing, willingly wanting to forgive us and rescue us and restore us. And we thank you that that's the kind of God you are. Help us, Lord, to be quick to run to you when trouble comes and find forgiveness and find your love and care and support. So, Lord, use these... Uh, Words, use these verses, use this passage, Lord, to encourage us, um, to challenge us, Lord, to be the kind of people you want us to be. We pray in Jesus' name.